Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesecke, and this is The Limiting Factor. This is part 11 of the Lithium Mine to Battery Line series to break down and understand what was unveiled at Tesla Battery Day. In this video, we'll be discussing the three cathode choices Tesla presented at Battery Day. We'll discuss the differences between those chemistries, why they were chosen for each product, and how they fit with Tesla's broader strategy. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors, and I hope will eventually allow me to do this full time. The links for support are in the description. Back to the cathode. The first chemistry is iron-based and long cycle life. It was designated for a mystery vehicle, the Model 3, and commercial energy storage. The iron-based chemistry that Tesla is referring to here is lithium iron phosphate, or LFP. The positives of LFP are that it has high power density. It's one of the safest battery chemistries. It's around 20% cheaper at the pack level than nickel-based chemistries. It has long cycle life, and iron is ridiculously abundant. This means there won't be any shortages of the primary metal used in the battery. The one negative of LFP is that it's low energy density. However, researchers and companies have leveraged the safety of the chemistry to increase the energy density of LFP at the pack level. In other words, the safety of LFP means less packaging is required to protect LFP than a nickel-based chemistry. Less packaging means less dead weight and cheaper manufacturing. This is why at Battery Day, Elon said that although LFP appears to have half the energy density of a nickel-based chemistry, it makes up for about half of that through reduced weight at the pack level. This is something I've been saying for quite a while, but Battery Day added a new twist which might change the equation. The structural battery pack that Tesla unveiled at Battery Day appears to level the playing field between LFP and high nickel chemistries by allowing high nickel chemistries to not only do cell to pack, but cell to structure. While it's definitely true now that LFP makes up for its low energy density by removing weight at the pack level, I don't know if that'll be true in the future in the post-structural battery pack era. The image on screen shows the battery cells packed in as tightly as they can be, which is usually a hallmark of LFP. Since then, we've received this image, which shows the backbone of the honeycomb matrix for cell to structure. I'm assuming this backbone will be used for both LFP and high nickel chemistries because it will provide rigidity for the vehicle frame. If that's true, I think there's a good chance that the structural battery pack will provide a moderate energy density increase for LFP, whereas high nickel chemistries will see the huge pack level improvements Tesla called out in the battery day slides. Let's get back to cycle life. On screen is a chart comparing LFP to high nickel chemistries such as NMC and NCA. The base of the Y axis is at 80%. When a battery can only maintain 80% of its original charge, it's considered end of life. My understanding is that 80% is considered end of life due to reliability concerns. The battery is losing its capacity to store energy because the materials in the battery are breaking down. The more of the material in the battery that breaks down, the more likely it is to fail. A failure can occur safely or in a ball of fire, but either way, even a small chance of failure isn't acceptable for most use cases. This is one of the reasons why my view is that Tesla won't get into second life battery recycling. Several people have asked me if LFP batteries can use a high silicon anode to increase their energy density. The answer is yes, but it might come at the cost of cycle life. The difficulty with high silicon anodes is their tendency to rapidly degrade. Although Tesla appears confident that they've solved the cycle life problem for high silicon batteries to be used in their vehicles, that doesn't mean they've solved the problem well enough for the high cycle life batteries required for robo-taxis. LFP batteries have long cycle life for two reasons. First, they operate at lower voltages than typical lithium-ion batteries. LFP has a nominal voltage of 3.2 volts, whereas high nickel lithium ion has a nominal voltage of around 3.6 volts. This means there's less chemical stress in LFP batteries to cause degradation. Second, they have an olivine crystal structure. 
Olivine crystal structures are bonded in three dimensions rather than the two dimensions seen in conventional layered cathode materials like LCO, NCA, and NMC. The additional bonding dimension stabilizes the crystal structure, resulting in longer cycle life. Silicon anodes generate degradation through expansion and contraction stresses, which lead to things like the loss of active lithium in the battery cell. This was covered in the Cracking the Silicon Code video. If someone can come up with a long cycle life silicon chemistry, we might see LFP extend its reach beyond medium range vehicles into the long range vehicle category above 300 miles. This is something I need to research further, and it might be a topic for a future video. Long cycle life LFP and silicon would be a killer combination. Back to the main point on LFP. Its cycle life is, at minimum, double that of nickel-based chemistries. 4,000 cycles with a 250-mile battery is a million-mile battery. That's perfect for commercial-scale energy storage and robo-taxis, which are the most demanding use cases in terms of battery cycle life. People have asked me if, like Tesla's high nickel chemistries, we could see a 56% reduction in cost at the pack level. My view would be no, for three reasons. First, LFP already uses cell-to-pack technology and therefore won't benefit as much from cell-to-structure if it does use cell-to-structure. Second, LFP may not incorporate Tesla silicon. This is because one of the primary reasons for choosing LFP is cycle life, which is greater than 4,000 cycles. Tesla silicon may not last 4,000 cycles. Third, LFP usually uses a large form prismatic format, which may reduce some of the benefits of switching to a 4680 format. It's worth noting that there will still be cost benefits from cell to vehicle integration and cell design, but those benefits may be less drastic for LFP. My non scientific estimate would be that Tesla LFP would be 50% cheaper rather than the 56% high nickel chemistries would see a 6% difference. If LFP is currently $80 per kilowatt hour at the pack level, and high nickel is currently $110, this means that after applying the benefits of battery day, LFP would be $40 per kilowatt hour, and high nickel would be $48 per kilowatt hour. We probably won't see sub $50 per kilowatt hour prices until 2025, but Tesla will unlock achievements along the way, like the Model 2 which really only needs a battery pack that's $60 to $70 per kilowatt hour to be a cash cow. LFP will be so cheap that I think it'll outcompete energy storage technologies like vanadium flow batteries and potentially Ambry's liquid metal battery. High volume manufacturing eventually drives the cost of a finished product down to the cost of materials that go into that finished product. Iron is cheaper than vanadium, and despite the appeal of dumping liquid in massive tanks to create a battery, I expect the economics and material costs will win out for LFP with high volume manufacturing. In my view, there may still be use cases for vanadium flow batteries, but there'll be specialty use cases. My view is the same for Donald Sadaway's Ambry technology. The LFP battery material cost is cheaper than the liquid metal battery material costs. But LFP battery cells are smaller and require more manufacturing. High volume manufacturing should even the odds. Furthermore, even though the liquid metal battery will be desktop size, it appears to require excessive packaging to contain the molten metal. Overall, LFP is perfect for energy storage because its major shortcoming, energy density, won't matter. The two primary considerations for energy storage are cost and cycle life. LFP will cost 10 to 20% less than nickel chemistries and has a cycle life at least double that of nickel chemistries. I don't see anything on the horizon that'll be able to compete with LFP for energy storage, and of all the lithium ion chemistries, LFP may play the largest role in accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy. However, as Elon said at Battery Day, for now, Tesla is focused on high nickel batteries. This means we probably won't see a Tesla-produced LFP battery in earnest until 2023. At that point, I'm hoping Tesla will have an in-house LFP battery ready for the Tesla Model 2. 
Let's move on to the second chemistry, which is the long-range nickel plus manganese chemistry designated for Powerwall, Model Y, Model S, and Model X. This is the chemistry that left me scratching my head the most. Elon stated that a chemistry composed of two-thirds nickel and one-third manganese is relatively easy to do. There were two options that ran through my mind. The first is the high-voltage nickel-manganese oxide spinel battery chemistry that I was excited about early last year. A spinel cathode is one where the lithium ions are stored in pigeonhole-type structures rather than layers. These pigeonholes hold less lithium than the typical 2D planes that store lithium ions in conventional lithium ion cathodes. The higher voltage is needed to offset the reduced lithium storage. Although that chemistry looks extremely promising and deserves a full video, it's still several years away from large-scale commercial production. The second option was to do a variation on the nickel, manganese, and cobalt layered cathode used in most lithium-ion batteries. This would involve removing the cobalt and using mostly nickel with some manganese, as Elon suggested. I'd never seen a chemistry like this mentioned in the research, but by a stroke of luck and a lot of trial and error, I found this paper from Jeff Don's lab in 2018. In typical Jeff Don fashion, he's grinding through multiple variations on a chemistry with a basic but robust set of tests. One of the chemistries used is NMC640, which would be 60% nickel and 40% manganese with no cobalt. The specific capacity of a cathode material like this would be around 180 milliamp hours per gram, which is about 20% less than Tesla's current cathode. However, that 20% energy density decrease would be at the cathode material level. Let's assume that the 20% energy density decrease would reduce vehicle range by 10 to 15%. 10 to 15% wasn't arrived at through robust calculations. It's my guess after taking into account energy density impacts at the cell level and the additional weight of a lower energy density battery pack. To do a proper calculation, we'd need a couple of dozen variables. That 10 to 15% sacrifice in range would be traded off for a few things that are more important for Tesla. First, manganese is about 90% cheaper than nickel. If one third of the cathode was converted to manganese, the cathode material cost would be 31% less than a high nickel cathode. A 31% cost decrease at the cathode material level would be roughly a 12% cost decrease at the pack level. Second, and more importantly, for the same amount of nickel, Tesla will be able to produce 50% more vehicles. Nickel is a critical consideration for Tesla because it's the element that Tesla is having the most difficulty sourcing. In most cases, cost is Tesla's primary concern, but I think this case might be an exception. My guess is that unlocking 50% more production means more to Tesla than the 12% cost decrease because it gets more cars on the road and generates more profit. Luckily, it's not a choice between the two, and Tesla will be getting both with a high manganese cathode. Going back to the research paper, the conclusion of the research paper is that cathodes with 60-70% to nickel and high levels of manganese are worth looking into. The paper did specify that 10% cobalt was required, but in light of more recent papers by Jeff Don's lab, there are other dopants that are able to replace cobalt. For example, 1% weight aluminum could be thrown into the chemistry to reduce cation mixing. If you'd like to learn more, check out the last video. Why is the Powerwall using the nickel-manganese chemistry rather than LFP? I think it's due to the amount of energy storage that Tesla can fit in the Powerwall and the difficulty of handling the Powerwalls if they weighed even more. Mounting a Powerwall takes several people because they're so damn heavy, roughly 100 kilograms. LFP Powerwalls would weigh roughly double that at 200 kilograms. As a final point, residential energy storage wouldn't require the super robust and cheap LFP chemistry because a residential use case is less demanding than a commercial use case, and I'm assuming would have higher margins. Finally, the high nickel chemistry for mass-sensitive applications like the Semi and Cybertruck, along with, I'm assuming, the Roadster and Plaid Plus Model S. This is the chemistry that Tesla devoted battery day to, and so we don't need to go deep here. However, there are two points worth touching on. 
There was a request on Twitter for me to make it clear that a million mile battery was unveiled at Battery Day. First, it's important to understand that the million mile battery is a phrase coined by the media to describe the battery from the Don Research Group, and we've all adopted it. I adopted it before I understood that it's so poorly defined that it doesn't actually mean anything. And I continued to use the phrase because it was a good stand-in until I had the time to explain further. Let's look at two ways that a million mile battery can be defined. First, if you build a battery with a thousand mile range that lasts a thousand cycles, that's a million mile battery. You can also build a battery with 250 miles of range that lasts 4,000 cycles, which is also a million mile battery. In other words, the million mile goalpost can have very little to do with the quality of the battery chemistry. The next way to define a million mile battery is through cycle life. However, a cycle life definition for a million mile battery can be fudged as well. If you adjust the temperature or depth of discharge of the testing conditions, you can easily extend or reduce the longevity by a factor of 10. This means that until a million mile battery is properly defined by some authority, somewhere, we need to take a pragmatic approach to defining a million mile battery. If we use the chemistry from the Don Research Group as a yardstick, a million mile battery chemistry is one that can hit 4,000 cycles under abusive testing conditions without breaking a sweat. The Don Research Group used higher voltages, higher temperatures, and deeper discharges than most vehicle batteries will experience. This is overkill, and I think we need to redefine what a million mile battery is. From here forward, I propose that we define a million mile battery as a battery chemistry that can hit 1 million miles with a 400 mile range battery pack. 400 miles of range is comparable to the range of an average ICE vehicle, and I think this will eventually be the average range of Tesla's vehicles within the next five years. To hit a million miles, a battery pack would only need to last for 2,500 cycles in real-world conditions rather than 4,000 cycles in abusive lab conditions. Tesla's current chemistry is good for about 2,000 cycles in real-world conditions. This means that Tesla only needs to increase the cycle life by about 25% to hit 2,500 cycles. As we saw in the last video, Tesla batteries from third-party suppliers may switch to an NCMA chemistry in the near future. If the data we see here for an NCMA chemistry plays out in real life, some of Tesla's longer-range vehicles may be able to hit a million miles of range next year. Although that's exciting if it pans out, NCMA still contains cobalt, and Tesla will switch to a cobalt-free chemistry for their 4680 battery cells. As we also saw in the last video, there are ways that Tesla can go cobalt-free and actually go beyond the cycle life of NCMA. If that's accurate, then a million miles should be in the bag. This will be due to both the cobalt-free chemistry and the larger battery packs we'll see in vehicles using high nickel 4680 battery cells. However, there is a wild card here, Tesla Silicon. If Tesla Silicon can keep up with the durability of the cathode, then everything I said above stands. If Tesla Silicon has a negative impact on cycle life, then we may see cycle life remain roughly the same. If that's true, the product lineup containing 4680 battery cells should still have greater longevity due to the larger battery packs. For example, the battery pack in the 520 mile range Plaid Model S only needs 2000 cycles to be considered a million mile battery. The same would be true of the Tesla Semi. What do I think? I think Tesla will slowly increase the amount of silicon in their batteries, and they'll ensure that Tesla silicon can keep pace with the durability of the cathode. That is, they'll focus on cycle life and safety rather than energy density. This means we won't see all the energy density benefits of Tesla silicon for a couple of years, but it does mean we can probably call what Tesla unveiled at battery day a million mile battery. Again, it wouldn't meet the standards of the media-coined million-mile battery that came out of the Don Research Group, but it's a more pragmatic definition. Another request from Twitter is that I bust the myth that Tesla said they will not offer vehicle-to-grid, also known as V2G. While it's correct that Tesla didn't say they won't offer V2G for the energy market, they certainly made it clear that there are challenges. 
If I understand Elon and Drew's wording, in Europe, it sounds like V to G would just be a software update and possibly an update to the vehicle's power electronics. In North America, V to G might require a software update, new power electronics, connectors, and a breaker box. I may not have this 100% correct, but the point is that we would probably see V to G in Europe first, and in North America, engineers might need to be diverted to adapt the hardware or to develop an elegant solution. My guess is that yes, Tesla vehicles will be able to do V to G at some point deep in the future, but I think it's at the bottom of Tesla's priority list. Tesla may even wait for regulations. I'm just spitballing here, but when enough customers get electric vehicles, they may start to wonder why they aren't able to, or allowed to, access the energy in their vehicle battery during emergencies for backup power. Or people might start demanding updates to regulations for the grid and electric vehicles that make energy market participation possible. Personally, I'm still holding out hope that I'll be able to connect my Cybertruck to the house with a 240 volt cable and breaker box during power outages. Hopefully we'll be finding out if that's a possibility by the end of this year. Wrapping things up, I've created this visual that illustrates the differences between the three cathode options. LFP will be dirt cheap, long cycle life, shorter range, and the least constrained by raw material availability. It'll be Tesla's workhorse chemistry and allow Tesla to absolutely cream it in the energy space. In most use cases, it'll be more viable than vanadium flow batteries and potentially more viable than Ambry's liquid metal battery. Nickel manganese will be average cost, average cycle life, moderate range, and free up nickel so that 50% more vehicles can be produced with the same amount of nickel. High nickel will be comparatively expensive, average cycle life, and long range. Its use case will be vehicles that are so large and have such a high mass that any additional battery mass would mean they wouldn't be commercially viable. High nickel batteries will also be for Tesla's ice killer vehicles like the Roadster and Plaid Model S. Many people will be wondering why I didn't include vehicle ranges here. The reason is that there is a big difference between potential range and the range we'll actually see in Tesla vehicles. That is, when Tesla accelerates production over the next few years, we may not see massive, triple-figure range increases if Tesla is still cell-constrained. That's not to say range increases from other tweaks won't occur, only that Tesla will need to be shrewd with its battery cells. For example, Tesla recently unveiled a new, long-range Model S. The range increased only slightly from the previous version, from 402 miles to 412 miles. This is despite an improved powertrain, module, pack, vehicle weight, drag coefficient, and heat pump. Tesla has gotten more range out of minor improvements like new bearings and software tweaks in the past. Surely with an entirely new platform, they'd eke out more than 10 miles. I think they've actually reduced the kilowatt hours of the pack from 100 kilowatt hours to around 90 kilowatt hours and diverted those cells to power walls and to power packs. As noted earlier in the video, at least for the interim, 400 miles of range appears to be the sweet spot, and it's better to apply those cells elsewhere. By reducing the pack size on the Model S by 10 kilowatt hours, they increase the margin on the Model S while freeing up one gigawatt hour of cells to be used in other products. This is Tesla's long-term focus on efficiency really kicking in at the bottom line. It's almost as if they're getting margin on their margin. In summary, Tesla's three cathode options are part of a broader strategy to optimize Tesla's vehicles and optimize the supply chain to navigate the square wave of battery materials demand that's coming in the next three to four years. That square wave may result in a global shortage of battery materials. Every other vehicle manufacturer will have vehicles that use battery cells less efficiently. Their vehicle manufacturing costs will be higher, they won't have in-house production to fall back on, and they may not have a variety of vehicles that are using a variety of cathode chemistries to reduce supply chain shocks. I'm eager to watch the game play out in the next few years as economic pressures mount on legacy automakers. It'll be like watching a Monopoly game after one player gains an advantage. As soon as the cash flow of the weak hands dries up, a crushing series of negative feedback loops will enter the equation. Tesla, on the other hand, will be flush with cash and positioned to acquire assets and talent. 
However, in this game, the money is for real, it's for keeps, and Tesla can play on several Monopoly boards at once. In the next video, we'll be looking at Tesla's cathode production process. At a large enough scale, every manufacturing process drives manufacturing cost down to the material costs. With the cathode factory, Tesla intends on reducing those material costs and setting their chessboard for 2025 and beyond. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video, or snag something off the merch shelf below. I'm also active on Twitter and Reddit. You can find the details of those in the description, and I look forward to hearing from you. A special thanks to Crafty Geek, Royal Purple, Jonathan Esper, David Gold, Jonas Solner, and Richard Brown for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.